All right, you guys. Um, want to thank you for coming in, braving the weather today. It really isn't that nasty out there, but I know some folks live up either side of the valley or out in the country. It can get a little nasty. Um, I had all of uh, six people in my eight o'clock. Uh, this is a close to what we usually get. So uh, again, thank you. Uh, I want to start by talking about Tuesday's lecture. And I'm not exactly apologizing for it, but um, it was kind of crazy. It was it was all over the place, and I couldn't figure out why I would have wrote a PowerPoint that poorly, um, that you know had talked about one thing for a slide or two, and then changed gears and talked about something else for a slide or two, and and then again and again and again and again, and and I, I was I was thinking about it and thinking about it, and I finally had a little time to look at it this morning, and. And what I really ended up looking at is is chapter four in the book, and um, I, I think I see the problem. I can't fit too much of it on the screen here, but what chapter four does is attempts to talk about the organisms in their physical environment. All right, and so what it was really doing was trying to talk about all the different ways that Mother Earth can mess with or occasionally enhance um, life on the planet. And as such, it, it looks like it is just all over the place. Um, so it started off with the stuff we did before the tests with the uh, different nutrient cycles. All right. And then it went into the incoming solar radiation. So I thought, oh, okay, we're going to have a nice conversation about this. And then remember, we switched gears like a slide or two later. Why? Because, well, then... It starts talking about the atmosphere, but only for three pages. And then it starts talking about the ocean and the ocean currents. And, and yes, it is all related, but at a way higher level than, than we get to in this class. And then there's actually a conversation about weather and climate, which I have an entire PowerPoint on the weather. Don't get me wrong, I could talk for two and a half lecture classes on the weather. But the book gives it four pages. And it's just way too much stuff for one chapter. Again, I get where they're going with it, but... And then they throw in earthquakes and volcanoes at the very end, because why not? Um, so I, I'm giving up on chapter four, is, is basically what I'm getting at here. Not that... Like I said, not that Tuesday was a complete wash. What we talked about, we talked about, and, you know, you're still responsible for a handful of things out of it that, that were pertinent, especially our conversation about the seasons, okay? Um, and I told you guys about that. That's very easily quizzable. Um, and But to all that stuff with the different uh, circulation patterns and stuff like that, when we get a little closer to test time, I'll, I'll help you sort through that uh, as to what we need to worry about and what we don't, okay? So I'm not even going through the rest of that PowerPoint, it was my point, okay? Uh, we are going to, though, is because one of the things it's, it does touch upon is uh, El Nino and La Nina, and since lately we've been affected by those, I do have a couple videos that I typically show in a different class uh, that I want to take a little bit of time and watch those, and then we're just going to move on, all right? So um, i got to grab an audio cable here real quick. Should be one here. Move my laptop a little closer, apparently. All right. Shoot. Hopefully the audio will be okay. Excuse me, would you mind taking a picture of us? Oh, no problem. Thanks. Ooh, yes, problem. You need Verizon. Get the new iPhone 15 Pro with tons of storage, so you can take all the pics. Trade in any iPhone in any condition and get iPhone 15 Pro and iPad and Apple Watch SE all on us, only on Verizon. A natural force of nature unlike any other. 
El Nino is capable of unleashing a fury of climate changes and natural disasters that span from Alaska all the way to South America and beyond. What causes El Nino and how are we affected by it? El Nino is not a storm, but rather a weather phenomenon in the Pacific Ocean. During an El Nino, the surface water temperature warms up, leading to complex weather patterns. South American fishermen in the 19th century, describing warmer waters during Christmas time, coined the name El Nino, Spanish for the Blessed Child. Nowadays, when sea surface temperatures in the equatorial Pacific Ocean rise 0.5 degrees Celsius over their historic average for three consecutive months, and once atmospheric conditions and rainfall patterns shift accordingly, scientists officially declare an El Nino. An El Nino event takes place about every two to seven years. Normal east to west trade winds over the Pacific weaken, and warm water that normally travels westward is now moving toward the east. Moisture then rises into the air, and the effects of El Nino are felt throughout the Americas. In the ocean, warm water pushes colder water downward, blocking the important upwelling of nutrient-rich waters from the bottom. This causes some marine life to migrate to colder waters. Animals that normally feed on the sea life suffer, and fisheries throughout Central and South America suffer too. But El Nino's most noticeable repercussions are felt on land. In the western United States and Central and South America, the warm air and moisture lead to increased storms, rainfall, floods, loss of life and property, and the increase of some vector-borne diseases like malaria, even in places where they don't normally occur. In Southeast Asia and Australia, the opposite takes place. These areas suffer from drought, wildfires, and colder ocean waters. In 1997 and 98, the world experienced the biggest El Nino in recorded history. Some estimates blame that El Nino for 2,100 deaths and $33 billion in damages. Mongolia saw temperatures reach 108 degrees Fahrenheit, there was record flooding in Peru, and the U.S. saw storms in the Gulf Coast, flash flooding from California to Mississippi, and tornadoes in Florida. Scientists are now better able to predict if and when an El Nino event will take place. This helps communities better prepare for the changes in weather patterns and better adapt to its repercussions. All right, we got one more here. Actually, two more. From long days splashing at the beach to the ongoing race between the sun and your ice cream. Yeah, it's fair to say us Aussies love summer. Wouldn't it be weird if there was some, like, Pacific Ocean weather pattern came along and there was colder temperatures and heaps more rain this summer? <laughs> yeah, about that. We've moved into an active La Nina phase out in the tropical Pacific. Yep, La Nina is back, folks. And it's here to rain on your summer parade. As you might have spotted, if you habla espanol, la niña is Spanish for the girl, while el niño means the boy. They're opposite ends of something called Enzo, or el niño southern oscillation. And it's all got to do with what happens out in the Pacific and how it affects weather here. In a normal year, the trade winds blow steadily across the tropical Pacific, and by Christmas, there's usually a build-up of warm water over our neck of the woods. Warm water evaporates and brings rain, and it's why the North gets its wet season. A La Nina year is when those trade winds have gone into overdrive, and there's much more warm water over here, which means, yeah, lots of rain. 
Typically, La Nina brings more rainfall, particularly across northern Australia and into eastern Australia as well. And as that wets up the soils, it does increase the risk of flooding whenever we get a, a big rainfall of it. The last time we were in La Nina, back in 2010 to 2012, it was the wettest two-year period in Australia's history. And it brought with it some pretty hectic storms, cyclones and flooding. Pretty unreal, eh? The water would just come up so quick, like, it's just risen. But every La Nina is different, and the weather experts say this one could be a little milder. While floods are always a possibility, some are hoping this La Nina will mean less bushfire risk over summer. And for farmers, the rain is a sight for sore and rather dry eyes. We might get an above average rainfall, which will grow uh, lots of grass and have fill all the dams and make, make it an easier season for us next year. As you probably already know, Australia has been going through one of its worst droughts on record. And some of it has to do with La Nina's hot and dry counterpart, El Nino. El Nino happens when the trade winds of the Pacific get really weak, or even reverse which means Australia doesn't get its usual share of warm water or rain. Most of our driest and hottest years have coincided with an El Nino. La Nina and El Nino are a natural part of the weather, but while they usually come every two to seven years, we're never really sure when one is around the corner. But experts say we are locked into this drizzly old phase until at least next autumn. So, for summer-loving, beach-going Aussies like myself, it might be worth packing an extra brolly for your next trip down the coast. And one more that is not Australian-based. Internet is creeping today. Creeping along very slowly. Oh, there it is. There we go. Warmer or colder than average ocean temperatures in one part of the world can influence weather around the globe. Boggles the mind, right? Here's how it works. During normal conditions, <coughs> trade winds, which blow from east to west, push warm surface waters towards Asia, piling it up in the western Pacific. In some years, though, the trade winds weaken, the warm surface water moves eastward, and reduces upwelling of cold water off the coast of South America. Climatologists call this El Nino. Its climate impacts show up mostly in the wintertime over North America. The warmer ocean fuels an intensification and southward shift of the jet stream. This brings flooding to the southern United States and warmer, drier conditions over parts of the Pacific Northwest, northern U.S. and Canada. But eventually, those trade winds pick up again and sometimes become even stronger than normal. When that happens, they blow the warm water back into the western Pacific and restart the upwelling of cool water towards the surface in the eastern Pacific. These strong trade winds are a signature of what is called La Nina, unusually cold conditions in the tropical Pacific that displace the jet stream northward. La Nina can lead to drought in the southern U.S. and cooler temperatures, heavy rains, and flooding in the Pacific Northwest. El Nino and La Nina together are part of a cycle that influences extreme weather and can impact food production, water supply, and even human health. 
not just in the U.S., but in many parts of the globe. All right, so hopefully that helped uh, maybe tie a little bit together uh, of what we talked about on Tuesday. For those of you that came in after um, after we started class, um, the uh, I explained why Tuesday was such a mishmash of things. Um, but this brings in now two of the topics, how we talked about. I'm trying to get this to stop where they're showing it. Maybe I'm not far enough back. Yeah, I'm not far enough back. Uh, so we talked about the ocean currents and, and how that mattered, or how they worked. And then we also talked about the wind patterns. So they're tying both of those together now with the trade winds. Remember we talked about the trade winds. And then it also talked about how the warm water and the cold water would cycle through the ocean and those ocean currents. So when the two of those come together then, we see these extreme uh, effects. We're in an El Nino now. You may have heard that word bopping around uh, on the weather, but um, weather forecast and whatnot. So I, I first came across this way back when for something, I think it was the first video mentioned about how it affects the uh, fishing uh, off of South America. And uh, I think it was an article about anchovies. Or my teacher, I didn't find it on my own. What are anchovies? It's a type of fish. And, um, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, they tend to, uh, they tend to swarm like they do on SpongeBob, exactly. Large. Yes, they are. Yes, they are funny. Um, so, at any rate, um, the, uh, it, the cold water, the water doesn't turn over right. The, uh, the proper food isn't there. So the fish migrate out farther. Uh, we had the same uh, effect, but for different reason, on the uh, East Coast over the last decade, or even longer maybe. Um, I doubt you guys pay a whole lot of attention to uh, what fish you get uh, at the stores or, and or at restaurants, but it used to be that everything and everywhere was either cod or haddock. All right, and then all of a sudden you're going, and then they're trying to sell you orange roughy or something else, and you ask them, you're like, well, what is, oh, it's a white fish, just like cod, just like this, don't worry about it. Well, what had happened was that all of the haddock and the cod, for a little while, they thought we had somehow all of a sudden overfished them, because the, the, the fishermen on the East Coast just weren't pulling in like they used to. So um, they had to start, you know, selling you other kinds of fish, right? Well, they did a study a couple years later, or somebody tripped over it, as often happens in science, the fact that the cod and the haddock had moved farther out. They like cold water. So close to the shore where the fishermen had been used to living, or been used to fishing, um, they, they, all the fish moved away. So they either had to do it because it takes gas money, right? Just like you and your car, those, those fishing boats take a lot, a lot of gas money and more time. So they either jack up the price of the haddock and the cod in order to get way the hell out where they are now, or they keep serving you other fish. So that's what was going on with that deal. And again, it was related to, not to El Nino or La Nina, but how the, uh, the, the uh, temperatures in the water can affect the uh, the organisms of the food supplies. So, anywho, so back to this here. We've got the trade winds uh, moving the surface waters westward, which allow the uh, cold water to upwell. Uh, but when the trade winds are weak, the warm water doesn't move out of the way. The cold water doesn't upwell. You don't get the El Nino. Okay. Um, well, no, that is the El Nino uh, when the water warm water doesn't move away. So, uh, at any rate, and then a little bit about La Nina there in the uh, Australian one. I, I don't know why I couldn't find an American. I suppose it's honest, bigger, <laughs> bigger problem in uh, the this, in this southern hemisphere. But I heard you. I heard you. I don't know what the Dutch flag looks like, though, so I apologize. <laughs> All right. So, anywho, uh, just a little bit about that. I've also, uh, I wasn't just... Uh, Checking Facebook while I was on my phone there. I was Googling for a couple articles 
Um, and I may introduce one of those as uh, as conversation fodder. So um, we're going to throw in El Nino and La Nina as one of the things that we are going to uh, keep out of Chapter 4. So uh, again, as I said before, a handful of you got back. Uh, at this point, we are kind of leaving Chapter 4 behind. And we are moving onwards, lecturally speaking. Okay, so next. We already did chapter five, so we're moving on to chapter six. Well, here's a question for you. What does extraterrestrial mean? Like aliens. I see. All right, aliens in the sense that they're what? Not possibly real. Not from, no, not possibly real. I know about that. Not from Earth, not from here. All right, terra. Terrestrial. Terrestrial, that means Earth or rock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, extraterrestrial means not from, or from beyond. Extra, like extraordinary. Extra credit. Extra, we use that word a lot as a prefix. So it means above and beyond. So that's what extraterrestrial means. It's not from here, it's beyond, from, from beyond here, so on and so forth. So terrestrial, we're talking about the land, basically. And you guys know what ecosystems are, right? Yes. Good, 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 good. And we know what the planet is. Yes. All right. So we're talking about ecosystems on the surface of the earth, dry land, so to speak. And this is the first half of chapter 6. So, first new word we need to tackle um, is biome. Biome. And um, a biome, I'm just going to read the definition here because I don't really have a better one for you. Uh, a large, distinct terrestrial region with similar soil, climate, plants, and animals, regardless of where it occurs in the world. So, what we're saying is that um, you can have a place... Uh, here on the east coast of North America, and maybe um, on the east coast, I'm just going to make something randomly up, uh, on the east coast of Africa, and uh, if you have the same or similar uh, soil and, and climate uh, and plants and animals, well, they would quite possibly be called the same type of biome. Now, you guys should know already that if you have the same kinds of conditions and they give you certain kinds of plants and animals that if you find those conditions elsewhere in the world we've been building up to this all semester, right? If you find those similar conditions elsewhere, you're quite likely to find the same kinds of critters and plants. That's that whole natural selection we were talking about. So it's not an entirely foreign idea, it's just a new vocabulary for, word for you here. And yeah, you might up until just this moment, and you may until after this class, just have called this an environment. Okay? We're going to use the textbook's words. We're going to use the proper word. We're going to call them biomes. But yeah, in the back of your head, you could probably just think of these as, oh, these are nine different types of environments. So, just a slightly different type of biologist comes up with slightly different vocabulary. Probably getting used to that by now in science. But before we can do that, we need to define a word or two. So uh, let's talk about climate. Because climate is different than weather. Weather is your day-to-day -day stuff. Climate is over a much longer period. And I'm going to wait and see if I have a slide or two about this um, before I say much more. Uh, so what kind of things go into climate? Well, very similar things that you think about when you think about the weather. Okay, uh, precipitation. 
not just what kinds do you tend to get, but how much. You might get a lot. You might get very little. You might only get rain and never see snow. You might only get snow. And that, of course, is affected by the second factor, temperature. We want to remind you that temperature is not just a function of latitude. In other words, how far north or how far south you go from the equator. All right. But also temperature is a function of elevation. We discussed that when we talked about um, uh, the atmosphere in chapter four, uh, just on the other day. Point being, you could be in Hawaii. And if you go up high enough on a mountain, you're going to find snow. You're gonna need a warm coat. Wait, in Hawaii? Sure, you just need a high enough mountain. All right. So, all right, that is what we mean when we refer to the elevation. All right, so yeah, I don't have any more slides on this. Um, climate, I think they usually throw out, I can't remember if it's 30 or 40 years, is a, is a what kind of the amount of time they look at when they want to decide what a climate is or if climate is changing all right big catchphrase nowadays um but that's the difference between weather okay weather is what you usually get on a day-to-day -day basis climate is over decades all right so bio as i said you guys probably in your head are just picturing the word environment that's fine but what it, it really does have a, a specific place here, okay? It's the next level of organization above the term ecosystem, which we learned a ways back. Uh, and just as a reminder here, we go community. And remember what goes before community? Species, right? Yes. So it's a community is a grouping of species, all right? The uh, ecosystem is a, uh, includes those plus all the inorganic materials that's going on, uh, and then biome is a step above that. Uh, the argument, I'm guessing, is that you could have multiple ecosystems within an environment. I'm uh, sorry, within a biome. Um, I don't know that I 100% agree with that. It's probably just because I'm lacking some bit of understanding about it, but nonetheless. Oh, there we go, second bullet. <laughs> As such, a biome can have different ecosystems in it. Um, anywho, we acknowledge uh, nine major biomes here on the planet Earth, and I do believe we're going to spend the next several slides discussing them. Some of these will be familiar, uh, some of them not. Uh, some of them you'll have heard the word and maybe thought it was something a little different. Regardless. All right, nice pretty color map here, yes. and uh, we see uh, more than nine uh, options here, three, five, ten. Oh, we see ten, not too many more. Um, one of these we won't be talking about. I'm guessing we won't be talking about mountains with complex zonation. We won't be talking about that one. But a tundra, we've heard that word. A uh, boreal forest, you might not have heard of boreal or boreal, some people pronounce it differently. Uh, temperate deciduous, temperate rain forests, temperate grasslands. Chaparral or chaparral. chaparral, desert, dry shrubby, tropical rainforest, tropical dry forest, we don't talk about that one, uh, savanna, heard that word before, all right, and then mountains with complex zonations, in other words, really confusing mountain yeah, ecosystems. Like We're going to find out, all right, bear with me. All right, and you see then by the colors there, uh, just a little foreshadowing perhaps of where some of these are. I don't believe, well, I won't even say that. I said, I don't believe I'm going to ever ask you, you know, what what region is known for having this kind of climate. We There, there might be a few references here and there, so I'm not going to make that blanket statement. All right, so here's the ones we are going to talk about. As I said, tropical rainforest. Temperate grassland, temperate rainforest, uh, boreal forest, chaparral, desert, savanna, tundra, and temperate deciduous forest. 
And yes, you're absolutely right in guessing that this is uh, nine, at least nine multiple choice questions on the next test. So, all right. So, what these are is a function of um, the climate primarily. All right. And uh, what we've got are temperature and precipitation is our two factors. But this one is also throwing in latitude. That's the third, uh, on the right side of this triangle here, that's the third axis that we're looking at here. Uh, they love to make these triangle diagrams in uh, ecology, uh, and, and they serve a good purpose, I get it. Um, it allows you to compare three factors really easily. Instead of just X and Y, um, we can throw Z in in a really easy to understand way. Um, and uh, what this is showing us is that depending on um, where you are or what's going down, um, one thing may be more important than another thing. One factor may be more important than another factor. The easiest maybe just to look at the, um, the middle one there. All right. Um, where it says temp temperate deciduous to temperate grassland to chaparral to temperate desert. Um, the big changer there because, you know, you're more or less at the same temperature because that's a, you know, straight line coming from temperature. You're more or less at the same uh, latitude. So what's actually changing here, what's changing is precipitation as we move from the left to the right from the temperate deciduous and we slowly decrease uh, precipitation. We see how we progress through there. All right. Um, also, the bottom one is, is fairly uh, easy to understand as well. Again, we're just looking at a decrease in precipitation. But instead of having moderate temperatures, hence the temperate word, um, we're sit down at the hot end of the axis. That's the left side. All right. And uh, so we're in hot areas here. So. Now, it, it's just unfortunately coincident that the word tropics and the word dry happen to meet over there in the bottom right-hand corner because we don't associate those two together ever, right? Tropics is the, the very wet. Uh, but that's just unfortunate wording. That is in no way supposed to imply uh, that the tropics are um, dry. Well, that is a desert, though. My bad. Um, so it, it needs to do that because it's a desert, but I don't want you to infer that Tropics are, are wet. Anyhow, aren't wet. I'll just shut up now and change slides before I confuse you even more than you probably weren't. That is probably not what you pictured for a tundra, is it? Yeah, I, I pictured, I grew up watching uh, those peppermint patty commercials, all right, when they talked about people striving, strutting across the, the cool tundra. They were trying to explain how pepperminty and refreshing it was, and they, they have these, these people with this wind blowing and trudging through on snowshoes, and, and maybe you might picture a dog sled or something like that. Yeah, that's not this. There are some parts of the world where we have tundra-type conditions, which we'll explain in a moment, that have plenty of vegetation. It may not be for several months, but it is there. And it does have an opportunity for them to go through their life cycle. The flowering plants need to flower, and they're not going to be there next year, so on and so forth. So tundra is land that surrounds the Arctic Circle, so very high latitude. This is our northernmost biome, and we see it in North America, Europe, and Asia. Okay, uh, And if you think about a globe, really that's everything that circles up there. Now I'm going to go back to that picture for a minute. We're going to call that a shrub in the lower left hand corner. But you notice, for the most part, there is not a nice big huge tree there. Anywhere to be seen. It doesn't support that. You don't get enough of the right conditions to allow something like a forest to kick in. So a treeless biome, harsh cold winters, and extremely short summers. 
but they do still get them, and they can, as you just saw. I picked that picture rather purposely. They can still go through and have a nice summer. I'm not going to quiz you on the levels of precipitation. This is really just here for reference, okay? Um, you can keep a running tally in the back of your head if you want to. Uh, what we'll be doing is, uh, you know, varying the amount of precipitation and, of course, the, the temperature. Those are our two, our two factors. Um, you'll see that this isn't, uh, well, I don't want to give it away. So 10 to 25 centimeters um, per year. You got two and a half centimeters to the inch for those of you not to grow up with metric. And not quite cut it in half and then take a couple off and that'll give you inches. So 50 to 160 days. You're looking at, you know, depending where you're at, 160 days, you know, that's that's going on uh, three, four months there for a growing season. But that's spring and summer. Sometimes like Utica, huh? Mm -hmm. Often as short as a month and a half. So the soils don't get a chance to develop. We haven't really talked about soils in here too much. You guys played with some in lab, but uh, we didn't really have a proper soil lecture yet. I don't know why. Um, permafrost is there, which means that the soil doesn't even necessarily thaw the whole dang time. Uh, maybe very briefly. And because of all these extreme conditions, as you can imagine, there's not a whole lot of variety of critters and or plants up there. Very simple food web, uh, really kind of like the stuff we, you know, we talked about. Um, large predator eats smaller predator, smaller predator eats shrubbery, and that's it. Um, mossens, lichens, and grasses. All right, we did see some, obviously, some sort of shrubby stuff there, but um, but primarily we got that. For critters, we're looking at lemmings, voles, weasels, arctic foxes, snowshoe hares, grouses, snowy owls, and muskox. Where's the predator in this ecosystem? Foxes. Yeah, weasels are actually quite vicious, too. Um, but they're going to go on the even smaller critters. Uh, don't forget about owls. Um, owls love them some mousies. All right. How about that there muskox? What's he going to eat? Grass. Yeah, the grasses and the whatnots. Um, your lemmings and your voles usually are, I don't know if they're 100% insectivores, but around here that's what they really enjoy. Um, this doesn't list that, but we have to assume there's something for them to eat as well, though, right? So, um, again, you know, just a handful Nothing really large. The muskox is even kind of surprising. That's a big critter to need. You know, they need a lot of food. Um, and to only get that, that pretty grassy stuff for a couple months out of the year, they're pretty, they're pretty grumpy the rest of the year. So. All right, the real forest. The real forest. We're coming down slightly latitudinally now. All right, we're no longer up at the Arctic Circle here. We're moving down a little bit, and we're obviously getting enough moisture now. We have the word forest here. We're obviously getting enough moisture now, not just to have lakes in the picture, but in order to support those trees. Remember, trees need a lot of water, a lot of water. So these are the cornic, conifer, I can't say it today, Coniferous forests of the north. Pine trees. Conifers. All right. Just south of the tundra. Forests of pine, spruce, and fir. Which are fairly drought resistant. I don't know why I felt the need to put that in there. Uh, again, North America, Europe, and Asia. So we're, we're circling the globe here. Just south of what we were talking about. Um, no southern hemisphere counterpart. Uh, there is no land. You got Antarctica and then a whole bunch of ocean, right? Till you get to Africa or South America or Australia, really. Um, so we don't have in that in that latitudinal range, we don't have anything down there.
Growing season's a bit longer. Soils still aren't great, but they're good enough for pine trees. All right, you're not going to find your nice pretty oaks and maples and all that stuff up there. Okay, they need much different environment. But the pine trees can hack it out. They can, pine trees can grow just about anywhere. Conifers, I'm sorry. I should use the proper word. Um, again, 50 centimeters a year. What were we before? 10 to 30, something like that? All right, we haven't quite doubled it, but uh, a lot more, a lot more precipitation. So that much more moisture, again, allows us to grow trees. And this covers 11% of the Earth's land. That's a fairly good chunk. It's a fairly good chunk. So permafrost is more scattered and a lot deeper, which allows the roots to take place, uh, to, to set in, which is also important for trees. Um, there's a lot of water up there left over from the Ice Age. And as you see now, we can support much larger organisms. Caribou, wolves, bear, mooses, and then your littler stuff. Your rodents, rabbits, lynxes, sables, and minks. We've moved up from weasels. Yes, there's still mouses and whatnot here. Don't get me wrong, but I'm trying to show you that we're supporting larger and larger critters. For those of you that don't know, caribou think reindeer, okay? Oh, rodents are in there, my bad. All right, getting even souther now. Look at that, we got ferns and trees. Temperate rainforest. Now remember, temperate means not so warm, not so cold. All right, temperate's a sciencey word for just right. Very lush, very rich, but this is not your tropical rainforest. This is not what comes to mind when you're talking about Central America, South America, stuff like that, or the Amazon. No, we're still way north. So again, conifers. But, <coughs> excuse me, warmer weather than we had before. Still cool, though, but warmer. Dense fog, high precipitation. Where is this? This is the west coast of North America, okay? They have it other places, sure. But when you think about it, we want you to think of, uh, you know, Seattle weather. It's always raining. It's never that, that cold, right? Never gets that hot either. Washington State, Bigfoot land, you know, you know the area. Or at least you've seen it on TV. But with all that, all that moisture, it's really, really makes great vegetation. Look at that, 127 a year. Remember, we were just at 50. Sure, they get the most of it in the winter time, and again, depending on elevation, it's still probably rain. There's a lot of mountains there, but there's also a lot of coastline. As we said, the winters are mild, summers are cool. The ocean tends to uh, stabilize temperatures. Large bodies of water in general tend to stabilize temperatures. Um, they take a long time to heat up, but they also take then a long time to cool off. And so what that does is it kind of just keeps things right in the middle. Um, obviously, we've all been to warm, well, or, you know, maybe not everyone's been, but we've all been to um, very warm, humid, arguably miserable places, i.e. Florida, um, by coastline, by the oceans, right? But we're really Florida shifting latitude. There. Sorry? What is I, well, it depends what time of the year you go there. If you go there in July, then some. You know. But, uh, so, obviously there's exceptions, but we're going for here just some, some generalizations. Winters are mild, summers are cool.
So this is tough for folks to understand. Um, I first learned about it with the uh, the rainforest, actually, the, the, the tropical rainforest, the one that everybody thinks of when you think of rainforest. They've got really crappy soils because the nutrients never even get a chance to, to get down in there. They're almost immediately sucked right back up. So we're starting to see that actually here. It's not like here where we live where the leaves can pile up for years and years and years and years and years um, and develop some really nice soils. But uh, we, we see this here though, again with the poor. Drop needles, again, if you have a pine tree in your yard, you know that those things really don't ever decay. They take a very long time. Um, and you know, that's, that's something that's built into them. It makes them a really durable leaf. It's great for that tree, and that's why that tree can survive in so many places. But if you have a, an area, especially if it's a big enough tree, and you have underneath that pine tree, um, you know that, uh, yeah, you could rake the pine cones out. Good luck raking the needles. And they really just take forever to break down. Um, cool climate, animal life, high species richness. And, and also, uh, we got to throw that little knock in there. Very heavily logged. Um, very few, uh, we have the word old growth forest there, a little further up. Um, very little old growth forest left. We actually have some in New York State. Uh, if you've ever gone east, once you get up towards Old Forge and head out um, towards uh, Speculator and whatnot, heading over to uh, Lake Placid area, there's a stand of old growth forest right in the middle over there. I'd like to think, we, we stopped by and saw it when we were driving through one time. I'd like to think it looks different. You know, trees is trees is trees, but um, it just felt a little, felt a little different. Everything else has been cut, you know, so many times we, we showed you on an almost opening day, all the logging that we did as we moved westward, right? Um, and even the stuff that they planted then, has grown and been cut down and you know you're on a couple generations later um, but there are a few places left that have the old growth uh, actually uh, Green Lake in Syracuse if you've ever been there they've got some pretty old stuff there as well please put your phone away or at least on mute during class sir thank you ah looky there Temperate deciduous. We'll get there. It is. What season might we guess that be? Yeah. So this is what you guys are familiar with, especially if you've spent the last 20 some odd years here. So temperate areas, moderate amounts of precipitation, you see we've dialed it back a little bit here, okay? These are more inland. Uh, you get seasons. You got your hot summers, your cold winters. All right. And again, this is what you guys know and presumably love. So what does deciduous mean? All right, we're talking about trees that lose their leaves, that do the fruits and nuts and berries and all that stuff. Um, things, you know, lose your leaves in fall, get them back in the spring. It's all part of their cycle. Your oak trees, your maple trees, all that stuff. That's deciduous. Um, and, uh, you do still get pine trees here. Don't get me wrong. A lot of times they're invasive species. We always think about critters as invasive species, but plants can definitely be invasive species. Uh, everybody's favorite one to hate. In the Giacco family, we actually uh, were a safe zone for them. Uh, dandelions, all right? Dandelions are an invasive species. They were brought over to be a pretty garden plant at some point, apparently, and they broke loose. Um, you drive around the uh, down the roads in summertime, all the purple flowers along the side of the road is uh, something called purple loosestrife. Again, another one that just escaped and went bonkers. Um, but pine trees are the same way. And a lot of places where they're trying, going in and trying to restore stuff, uh, what they're doing is cutting the pine out, 
because they grow better, faster, bigger, and then the other stuff doesn't have room to grow. Uh, and they're trying to restore these forests to, to what they probably weren't in a very, very, very long time, but, but bless their hearts for trying at any rate. Um, so just what you would expect, uh, what you're used to, deer, bear, and a handful of other variety of small animals. Um, again, this biome has mostly been regenerated after we cut the bejesus out of it um, a couple hundred years ago, be it for farming and or timber harvesting, okay? Um, but there are still some a few stands here or there. Grasslands. What do you think the predominant vegetation is in a grassland? So what animals are those? Grass. Grass. Good. Good, good, good. Uh, bison or buffalo to answer your question. Um, so yeah, grasslands. It's nice that we name something what it is, right? Got to appreciate that every so often when we get it. Hot summers, cold winters, and not enough rain to grow trees. We're back to that again. These tend to be inland, all right? which can cut you off from the oceans, which cuts you down on your precipitation. Your tall grass prairies and your short grass prairies, they come in two flavors, all right? Um, and again, probably moisture related. It's funny, I was just gonna say, when we talk about the grasslands, think Little House on the Prairie, but you guys have probably never seen an episode of Little House on the Prairie. I didn't watch it when I was a kid, because it was like, I thought it was boring. But um, but yeah, pioneer days kind of stuff out in out in there. Um, again, not a whole lot of trees, but it was decent for growing um, vegetables and whatnot. So we managed to stay there, you know, quite some time. Well, obviously, a lot of people still live uh, in that. I don't want to call it the Midwest, but because uh, that's like Ohio, Indiana. But yeah, you know, just past there, and before you get to the Rockies, kind of thing. Um, those are your grasslands. And again, fairly removed from the ocean, so it's hard to get, even though, don't get me wrong, they get some plenty of snow, but it, it, generally speaking, it's hard to get moisture out there. And you see we dropped in the moisture levels again. If you pay attention to stuff like what happened to all our buffalo and why don't we have so many antelope and so on and so forth anymore, you probably know uh, that we, you know, got rid of the, area that they like to live in. Uh, same reason why we see deer moving into our neighborhoods. And that's just the yummy shrubs. That has a lot to do with it too. But the woods where they naturally lived in, you know, are getting fewer and fewer, supposedly. So um, we've definitely taken care of this This uh, for them. We got rid of the grasslands. At the very least, we put up fences, right? Um, bison, sure, we hunted them like crazy but also it's an environment, a habitat kind of thing. Uh, prairie dogs, etc., still out there in a plenty. Uh, the last bullet here is kind of interesting. I was focusing on precipitation, but um, something I, I, it's definitely worth pointing out is that um, wildfires are natural. They are a part of nature. Lightning catches stuff on fire all the time. And um, it, to the point that some, uh, and I, I, I don't know if there's other varieties of, of trees that, that do it as well, but I definitely know some pine trees uh, have developed to the point where their pine cones won't even open up until uh, they get scorched. You burn the hell out of the place and then the cones finally open up and drop their seeds. So uh, it, is a, it is a part of nature. Um, so we got to be careful, and they, they are careful about it, but everything now is so politicized, so news-oriented. Um, you know, there's, oh my God, there's a wildfire, we got to go put it out. Well, some of them we want. Again, we mess with things by putting houses and, and stuff in the middle of where they never used to be. So yeah, okay, now we have to put out this fire because we're going to burn down these million-dollar houses. Okay, then fine, whether Mother Nature started it or not. So it's, it's complicated, but they are a natural part. Um, 
a natural part of nature that's redundant, but you know what I mean. Chaparral, which is Latin for shrubs. No, it isn't, but that's what I want you to think of when you think of chaparral. Just think of the land of a thousand shrubs. Okay. So this is your Mediterranean climate. Southern California, Greece are two good examples. I'm sure you could all picture both of those. But um, so mild winters with some water, hot, dry summers, a lot of forest fires. Well, wildfires, sorry, I should call them wildfires, not forest fires. Not always in the forest. This is great for grapes, by the way, if you happen to notice the connection there. Southern California is wonderful for grapes. Greece and Italy, wonderful for grapes. The Lakes region, wonderful for grapes. We've got a bit too much. My geography is horrible. So I'm going to stick with the countries. If the Adriatic Sea happens to be by those countries, then, then yes, that would apply. I don't have a map to look at. But it falls in Okay, thank you. It would not. Um, at any rate, so um, we also have a bit of a Mediterranean climate here. You go all along uh, Ontario, uh, down into the Finger Lakes, you're probably aware, and even across, uh, and I grew up in Ohio, um, with Lake Erie, we, we've got it as well. It's wonderful grape uh, growing weather. It's different kinds of grapes, if you hadn't noticed. Uh, the wine is, is certainly a little different. Um, I know you guys aren't quite old enough, but nonetheless, um, we get it. We get a bit more moisture, though, than, than we're not chaparral, but uh, you will see people refer to that as a Mediterranean climate. So, as I said, shrubs, 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 shrubs. Um, not everybody can eat shrubs, all right? They're a good bit chewier than grass. So again, you're limited to certain creatures, and that was good for them, right? They were able to say, okay, it's too crowded in these grasslands, or it's too, I don't want to get stepped on by a bison. I'm going to go hide over here where the bison don't like to go, and I'm going to eat these shrubs because, well, I can't. Um, birds, of course, it's great for them. Uh, again, it's kind of hard to land on grass. It could, but... It's a lot easier to land on something woody. So uh, we see, you know, definitely great variety of birds there. Moving right along, we keep decreasing and decreasing our moisture, don't we? Uh, but this looks fairly lush. Certainly not what you might expect for a desert. Guaranteed this isn't around the whole time, the whole year cactuses, but the rest of that stuff will go with the growing season. So again, lack of precipitation limits plant growth. We find these in temperate and some subtropical regions. Again, if you get far enough away from the coastline, you can it can be very hard to get moisture. All right, so if you're even, you know, thinking, oh my gosh, I'm getting really close to the tropics, why, why isn't it super moist? If you're far enough inland, less than 25 centimeters per year. This is back where we started, right, with the uh, uh, the arboreals and the, uh, oh, the first one that we started with, it jumped my mind now, but um, tundra, thank you, all right. Very little precipitation, but uh, much, 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 much warmer. So not a whole lot of vegetation, and what you do have there is very drought-tolerant stuff. Um, this one's interesting. Because of the temperature extremes that you experience here, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to go to the deserts, but uh, the, the temperature swings are insane. 
um, very, very hot during the day, and arguably not cold by if we measure by the number, but cold if you look at the, 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 the drop of degrees from day to night. Sometimes there's not a whole lot of moisture in the air to hold the clouds. Remember, the clouds are what helps hold our, our heat in. Um, so you just see these massive swings. And uh, if you think about it and you think about what you know about metabolism, we didn't really talk about metabolism in here, but that's what keeps you, uh, as a warm-blooded animal, that's what keeps you warm. Hey, wait, but it's really good. Uh, are, are we warm-blooded or warm? Warm. Okay. Yeah, we're warm-blooded. Almost everything is except uh, you want to think about your reptiles. They're cold-blooded. Absolutely. Birds are somewhere in between, but generally speaking, not. They don't. When they say cold blooded, they don't usually mean birds. But uh, so we need our metabolism, right? So think about that with food. Food is how you maintain your metabolism. Um. So and also your body size. It takes a whole lot more. The bigger you are, the more food and energy you got to burn to keep your temperature up, so on and so forth. So you tend to see smaller critters out there for that very reason. They, it's just easier to maintain a stasis. And it's easier to, uh, to, to bring food into a smaller body. So you're not going to find bears in the desert and moose in the desert. Okay. Um, you know, you might see some deer sort of critters, sure. But uh, for the most part, for the most part, we're looking at smaller things. Savannah. Ever since Lion King came out, everybody knows Savannah. <laughs> but um, when did the Lion King come? I don't know, but as long as I've been teaching practically. Um, but uh, everyone knows the Savannah, and they can name more animals on the Savannah than they probably could in the grasslands here in America. But that's okay. That's all right. Um, it's a mixture. You get some trees. But mostly, mostly grasses. Decent amount of critters. Water holes here and there. Most of that stuff. Disney's getting much better about portraying reality. I will say that. So, oh, there we go. Tropical grassland with widely scattered trees. Uh, temperature is just pretty much hot. Okay. Um, yeah, it does, you know, wax and wane a little bit. Um, but it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty steady. Um, precipitation though, they have the rainy season. Okay. Um, so seasons are more there recognized by whether or not you get a lot of precipitation than if the temperature changes, which is kind of interesting. Uh, look, we shoot up massively, uh, on our, uh, our amount of, of uh, moisture. But again, that's coming in a very short time period. I don't remember how long the, the rainy seasons are, but again, it's, it's not the whole year, obviously. Which is why there ain't a whole lot of green there. Okay? This is probably a dry season or just coming into the rainy season or all that grass would be green. All right, now that this is in uh, food everywhere, how do you say that word with the capital A there? Acacia. That's what I've always said. I worked at a place called Acacia. Okay. I, I, I've heard people say like acai and stuff like that. Acai. Turn the, C, <laughs> the C's into S's. Uh, but I've always said Acacia, but apparently that isn't how you pronounce it, I guess. I don't you know. know. Acacia Hold on. Now I'm going to All right. Uh, herds of hooved animals, all right? And because there's tons of herds of hooved animals, we've got plenty of predators to eat them. Um, so you got your lions, your hyenas, your hyenas. I kind of thought were scavengers, but I, they are scavengers. I thought so, but yeah, I guess they get hungry enough, they can't find something. But, uh, but yeah, so whatever the lions leave behind, the hyenas come in. Again, just think about the food chain. We talked about all those trophic levels. No uh, lions eat hyenas. Um, well, I'm sure they could. I think they prefer the hooved animals, but 
I'm sure the the, the nice uh, antelope tastes better than yeah, hyena. Yeah, there are hyenas. It's in, a queso. It is a queso. Okay. There are hyenas in Hawaii, too, right? I'm, yeah. yeah, I believe so. Yeah, they're the. <laughs> Well, I'll tell whomever then that uh, they've been saying a sign. Maybe I'm thinking of a different thing um, that's that's out nowadays. It's in the smoothies and the bowls and whatever. Oh, acai, uh, the uh, acai bowls? Yes, that. That's not acai the same bowls. word here? Oh, see, I'm acai old. I don't know. A-C-A-I. Wait, say that ah, again. It's pretty dang close. You see my confusion. Wait, say that again. Acai. That's the word I was thinking of. Acai. Is it a grain? The I grain? So what is it? I have no idea. It's a fruit bowl. It's fruit? Okay. I only sell it, and I know I've mispronounced it because my son always corrects me, and my daughter. Oh, wow. Well. So, I was thinking that was a say. So that is acacia. Good. Good. A side. All right. And it's a fruit. Well, we'll Google that one next. But, uh, so, anywho. Um, so, Savannah is exactly what you guys imagined, okay? And, um... And again, for once, we have uh, the media to thank for that. Tropical rainforest. All right, when you think lush, when you think biodiversity, this is probably what comes to mind. Okay? And uh, again, when I was growing up, 80s into the 90s, everything was save the rainforest, this, save the rainforest, that. And I'm not saying that in a you know, poo poo kind of thing. Um, the, 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 the deal is, is that we have, because of a lot of the uh, challenges that this environment provides, we have explored so little of it, and uh, we know so very little of it, and um, they're just worried about what we're getting rid of before we even know it's there kind of thing. Also, of course, yeah, sure, oh, there's all those systems and cycles that we need it for, but a lot of it is, is the whole biodiversity thing, okay, because again, the more opportunities you have, the more niches you have, and these guys provide a lot, um, the species richness just grows logarithmically. Um, it's, it's, it's insane. So warm and moist, primary, yes, lush, uh, primarily equatorial. All right, look at the precipitation. Good Lord. Okay. But again, Hardly any of it makes it into the soil. You're not really going to go there and tap, you know, wells for groundwater. It goes right back up into those trees. Um, and the constant mist and so on and so forth. Again, Hollywood does a pretty decent job of portraying this area. Huh? It is, and that's exactly what I was saying. So not only the moisture never gets down there, but when the leaves and fruit and all the poop from all the critters that traditionally would help build a soil somewhere around here, because there's so much um, vegetation there, it just, it just never makes it down in. It gets broken down and absorbed right back up. So yeah, the soils are garbage there. But you, it, it's a very, it's a, not an oxymoron exactly, but it's... What do the trees have called pollen? Huh? What do the trees call pollen in the south? They have different roots to accommodate for it. Yeah, because they don't, you don't, you're not going to have super, super deep roots because there's nothing down there to feed on. So they've got a lot of the wide slate, and that's possibly why it's really easy for us to go in and clear cut them. Pretty easy to knock down. But, uh, yeah, totally. It, 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 the trees would have different root systems. Um, so, yeah, yeah, ancient, uh, nutrient poor soil. Uh, nutrients are all tied up in the vegetation. Um, three distinct canopy levels. I don't know if I have a slide about that one or not. What we're saying is that uh, is a vertical zonation, okay? Um, and this is, again, picture, you know, like the, the, the trees where there's mosses and, and stuff growing in the trees themselves. The trees become an ecosystem, um, not just the trees are part of an ecosystem. They're places where organisms possibly live out their entire lives. Um, be they plant or animals. Um, this is where we get the mostest of the reptiles and the amphibians, and Lord knows the bugs. Um, are just, it's, just, it's just amazing there. And then, of course, stuff that eats that to some extent, but you're not going to get you know, your large predators. You're certainly not going to get large herbivores going through there. Um, there's often just not enough room. Yes, sir. 
Would you be able to put Dora on top of it, please, and see if we can make her on me because she's going on top of me? I think that's possible. I suppose you could. I don't know if you'd need to. It's doing fairly well enough on its own. But um, they, they, you get a lot of, of mosses and stuff that span the branches and stuff. It sort of accommodates the same thing. And even in like the nooks and crannies of the branches uh, where stuff can accumulate, even that, not too horribly big, but can be you know, the size of your palm, uh, can certainly be an ecosystem in and of itself. So, yeah, they, they take care of themselves um, if we let them be. But I'm sure somebody out there, some entrepreneur, is trying to do something better. We always want to help in quotes, but. Okay, so we do talk about the canopy layers here. Uh, the topmost is the tree crowns. Not a whole lot lives up there. Um, and I think that's another famous movie scene. Somebody finally gets like to the top and looks out over the, they climb to the top of the tree and they look out over that hole. It's like you're, you're a little tiny guy staying on a, on a, on a head of broccoli, right? And it's just green all around you. Um, but uh, there's, there's not a whole lot of life up there. The middle, um, where it's just branches and, and leaves and stuff, is, is fairly uh, good. Uh, the forest floor itself, okay, we talked a little bit about ferns earlier. Ferns are great for being able to grow uh, with not a lot of direct sunlight. You'll oftentimes, again, if you have, uh, you're in a pine forest or whatever, or just any forest, uh, you're quite likely to see uh, ferns in there. Uh, but there's many others, many others. Um, you see here, and I'm not sure where they got this statistic from, two to three percent of the sunlight that's hitting that, that the crowns is making it down to uh, the forest floor there. Okay, so just a tiny amount of sunlight. Yet they still grow some great plants. All right. So we have burned through the, uh, the different types of biomes that we want to focus on. Again, your book might mention a couple more. If I didn't talk about them in here, I'm not going to ask you about them on the test, okay? Um, so when you are studying for test number three, uh, which won't be too horribly long from now, um, worry, about, worry about these. Uh, when we come back for our next lecture, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the same idea, but water. All right, all the different aquatic biomes. And guess what? They don't call them biomes when they're in the water. I don't know why, but they don't. They have another word for it.